We recently began a series of studies on the 23rd Psalm. So before we turn to the Psalm, let me read it. And as I read it, let us pray that the very reading of God's word will minister to our hearts and minds. The 23rd Psalm, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This evening we will reflect on the words we read at the beginning of the third verse. He restores my soul. Now Psalm 23 is more than anything else a song of trustful personal confidence in God. David makes no pleas in the psalm, there are no askings, there are no petitions, there are no intercessions. He is simply rejoicing in the Lord's great goodness to him. And that in itself reminds us that the life of faith at times is a life simply of rejoicing and blessing God for who he is and for all that he has done for us. I remember many years ago reading some words of Thomas Goodwin, um, mid 17th century English Puritan, and he is speaking about communion with God and he puts these words in to God's mouth. The Lord says, when will you come to me without any petitions? When will you come to me just for myself? And David here is simply celebrating the Lord and his goodness and mercy and kindness and grace to him. And not least amongst the Lord's great kindnesses to David was he restores my soul or he restores my life or perhaps even he restores me. And I'm sure there are few words uh, more sweet to a Christian believer's ears than these. He restores my soul. And, and the reason why these words are so sweet to us is because we all know only too well what it is to stray from our kind and generous hearted Heavenly Father. We know what it is to defect in our hearts from his love and his grace to us in Christ. We, we know only too much to our shame what it is to be seduced away from his fellowship by what the Bible calls the fleeting pleasures of sin. But the question is, how are we to understand these words of David? He restores my soul. The verb David uses here, um, which is translated in the ESV translation, restores, has a range of meanings. But actually at its heart, it, it means to turn back. He turns me back to himself. And that, that's so vital to understand. He doesn't turn us back simply to the church. He doesn't turn us simply back to truth, though please God he does that. He turns us back to himself. There are perhaps, I think, two ways that we can understand precisely what David is saying here. He could be saying, he refreshes my soul. That is, he restores freshness to my life. And if you read the opening words of verse 3 in the light of verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That makes good sense and it's wonderfully true. God refreshes, revitalizes our souls. I'm sure like me, there are times in your Christian life when you become spiritually jaded, when the gospel of the grace of God is not as sweet to you as it once was. When you find worship on the Lord's day lacking in delight, when you just perhaps feel washed out and you understand what William Cooper meant when he, he penned the words, where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord. He refreshes my soul. And if we were to ask, well, how does he do that? Well, earlier, earlier in Psalm 19, um, the psalmist tells us precisely what that means. Again, it's a Psalm of David, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law that is the instruction of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. God gives us a new relish for his word. Sometimes the reading of God's word becomes a routine. Maybe not for you, but certainly for me. And then the Lord graciously comes and by his spirit he brings his word to bear in a, a new, refreshing way into our lives. And, and that could precisely be what David is, is saying here. He refreshes my soul. But secondly, and I think probably more likely, David is thinking about the Lord's grace in restoring him, a believing man, back to himself. Now, as I mentioned, the, the Hebrew verb restore has this idea of being turned back. Actually, it's the same idea at the heart of repentance, to be turned around. David knew only too well that the best the most privileged, the most favoured of believing men and women sin. And at times we sin shamefully and at times disgracefully. And David knew that only too well in his own life. And more than that, and perhaps even more seriously than that, actually, we sin and wander from the Lord in our hearts. We can be outwardly as we ever have been, but inwardly our hearts have become coldly estranged from the Lord. That's the great rebuke of the risen Christ to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2. This was a church that outwardly was, was doing superbly well. It was faithful, it was hardworking, it wouldn't tolerate error. It committed itself heart and soul to the service of God. And yet the Lord Jesus says, I have this against you. You have abandoned, it's a strong verb, you have abandoned, forsaken the love you had at the first. Outwardly all was well, but inwardly there had been a, a creeping, cold defection from the Lord. And it's more probable, I think, that David is saying, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. He brings me back to himself from the dark paths of sin. Now the Bible has a word for that and it's the word grace. Grace and grace is to many people a scandalous word because it or better he when we think of grace we should never depersonalize it as if it were a, a blessing separated from the person of the Lord our God. Grace is God acting in undeserved kindness and mercy towards us. Grace restores an adulterer and a murderer like David. Now try and take that in. We, we sing so easily about grace. I preach so easily about grace. When were you, when were, was I at last overwhelmed by the sheer inexplicable wonder of the grace of God in Jesus Christ? It's an evangelical commonplace. We're saved by grace. We sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But actually, what's so amazing about grace to us? 
when we were stopped in our tracks, humbled, made speechless by the inexplicableness of God acting towards us in undeserved kindness and mercy. David was an adulterer. He seduced another man's wife. He later conspired to cover up his crime by engaging in a plot to murder Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and succeeded. Grace to many people is scandalous. What was a man like that doing in the church? Well, he's a testimony to the out of this world kindness and love of God. There are no human paradigms or parallels to it. Think of Peter who denied Christ three times. Who would have ever thought that someone who publicly with curses denied the Son of God, the Lord of glory, could ever be restored uh, to the church, never mind to the Lord and to his service, but Peter was. Jesus restored him. I have a friend who for some years confessed the Lord Jesus Christ, but then later turned her back on Christ and wrote to all her friends telling them that she had abandoned Jesus Christ. She believed no longer in him. And then 15 years later she turns up literally out of the blue to our church in New Mills and asked me to visit and visited her and her husband and could someone like me be restored? I think I simply smiled and said, worse than you have been restored. And the Lord wonderfully restored her, then converted her husband. And people say, well, how is that possible? How can God restore the vilest of sinners? Well, because he is who he is. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't ignore our sin. Indeed, in his own son, he has provided an atonement for our sin. The grace of God isn't cheap. It's costly. It costs God everything, if you like. It costs us nothing. But it cost him everything because in the Lord Jesus Christ, God found a way to justify the ungodly. He found a way to remain righteous and just and yet at the same time to be gracious and merciful to sinners. It, it was God's grace that provided for us the atonement, the putting away of our sin in the sin-atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we can say to people, though your sins are as scarlet, they can be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they can be as wool. Because the God of the Bible is rich in mercy. Let's think about what these words of David have to say to us. He restores my soul. Let me mention one or two things in particular. His words remind us that the best of believing men and women, old covenant Christians, new covenant Christians, the best of men and women, fall into sin and need God's restoring mercy. Never think, far less say, well that could never happen to me. You read about David's adultery with Bathsheba and you think, well that's, that's awful, I could never do that. I remember sitting in an airport in the USA with a very dear friend, one of the finest Christian ministers I've ever known, wonderful man, wonderful preacher, and we were talking and we were talking about something that had happened to someone we knew. And my friend said, you know, Ian, I could never do that. And I remember looking at him and he looked at me and he said, what a stupid thing for me to say. There but for the grace of God, I would be only too ready to do that. 
the sin of David, the sin of Peter, the sin of whatever has happened to better Christians than you and me. No Christian is invulnerable to spiritual and moral declension. And here David leaves the pastoral imagery behind, doesn't he? He's writing, I think, out of personal experience. He restores my soul because he knows only too well what it is to wander away from the Lord like a silly sheep wandering away from the security and protection of the shepherd. For almost a year, David lived in this no man's land of moral and spiritual declension until Nathan the prophet, you read about it in 2 Samuel 12, I think. Nathan the prophet comes and says, you are the man. And God uses his servant Nathan to pierce David's heart. Now, whether David writes this in the wake of his tragic and shameful adultery with Bathsheba and his complicity in her husband's murder, well, it's, it's impossible to say. But what we can say is that David knew in his own life the tremendous need, the, the urgent need to be restored to God. Every one of us, every Christian, is only a step away from shameful sin. Only a step away from shameful sin. And only a step away from a less obvious, but perhaps even more tragic, declension from the Lord, a cold, creeping disinterest in spiritual things. That's why it's a wonderful thing to see older believers going on. The passing of the years has not dulled their desire to honour the Saviour who loved them and who gave himself for them. That's why older Christians need to understand that their very presence faithfully at worship, Sunday by Sunday, week by week, month by month, year by year, is an eloquent sermon to, to younger believers. But there is this danger of a cold, creeping disinterest in spiritual things. And we live in a world that's so so technicolour in its visualness. Sin comes to us in, in a variety of um, technicolour variegations. The, it assaults our senses. You can hardly turn your head one way or another when you're out without being assaulted by the temptation uh, to sin. That's why there's so much in the Bible about making a covenant with your eyes. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I might not sin against you. I was reading a while back these words of Thomas Manton. Um, I don't just read 17th century English Puritans, uh, but Thomas Manton, um, Banner of Truth, have just published, um, republished his works, 22 volumes. Uh, I got them a couple of weeks ago. Um, Thomas Manton wrote these words, Though the pleasures of sin are short and inconsiderable, yet because they are near at hand, they have more influence than the joys of heaven, which are future and absent. Many part with the joys of Christianity for the vilest price. He's saying, you know, sin can be powerfully, compellingly seductive. Isn't it striking that Jesus, almost his last words to his disciples, almost his last words before his arrest, his trial and his crucifixion, almost his last words were these, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The best of Christians need to be restored. Every day, I think, we need to come and say, Lord, restore and renew and refresh me. Let me experience again the, the grace of your kind, generous-hearted love.
But secondly, David's words, of course, above all, remind us of our heavenly shepherd's mercy and kindness. He restores my soul. The great subject of the psalm is the Lord, just as he is the great subject of the whole Bible. Behold your God. He restores. And this may be Christianity 101, as our transatlantic uh, friends would say, basic Christianity. But it's so glorious to know that however badly sin and Satan have marred your life, he restores. He restores. Remember the words in Joel chapter 2, I, says the Lord, will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. Maybe that's someone's uh, situation here uh, tonight. These past weeks, months, years, it's just as if the locusts have come and eaten away the, the joy, the peace that you knew in former days. Maybe life has become a catalogue of sadnesses. Maybe there's been an internal defection from the Lord. Maybe nobody knows it, but you yourself. I will restore. He restores my soul. Or these great words in Hosea 14, the last chapter of the book of Hosea, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. Now, how does God do that? How does he heal our waywardness and love us freely? How does he restore to us the years the locusts have eaten? Well, almost always through his word and by his spirit. He confronts us with the sinfulness of sin. We, we become awakened to what Romans 7 says is the sinfulness of sin. We, we discover afresh how vile sin is, that sin is against God. Earlier Christians often spoke as, of sin as de kidium, simple Latin compound, God killing. If sin had its way, it would kill God. If sin had its way, it would kill the Holy One. And the Lord restores us by bringing to us afresh, how, how could I do such a thing and embrace this wickedness that seems so seductive but would kill God if given half a chance? But not only does he confront us with the sinfulness of sin, he, he then impresses on us the grace and sweetness of his love. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, said Jesus. For I am lowly of heart. But you know, there are times when God, by his word and through his spirit, uses other believers to bring us back to our senses and to restore us to himself. David found that in the prophet Nathan. God used Nathan to be his instrument in convicting David and in bringing him in repentance and faith. You read about it in Psalm 51. But you know, in a more general sense, we are all to minister the grace of God to one another. Remember how the final chapter of Galatians begins, Galatians 6 verse 1. Brothers, restore one another. Restore one another. We have an obligation not to leave it to the minister and the elders, though they may have a, um, a principal responsibility in the life of the congregation, but we are all to minister to one another. This is the priesthood of all believers. We are to be God's agents of his grace and kindness to one another. And to do it, Paul writes to the Galatians, in a spirit of gentleness, not of censoriousness. It's so easy to be holier than thou. But we are to restore one another in a spirit of gentleness, knowing that they are but for the grace of God. But thirdly, I don't think we can leave it there because we need to see these words within 
what we might call the bigger picture. This is the microcosm, the David, the individual believer's testimony. He restores my soul. But when you look at the landscape of the Bible, when you go from Genesis through to Revelation, you discover that God has a grander plan and purpose. It's not simply restoring one here and, and one there and one over there. God's ultimate purpose is to restore all things back to himself, to fix this broken cosmos, to repristinate the cosmos, to make a new heavens and a new earth the home of righteousness. That's why we are to see every repentance and every healing in the New Testament as a harbinger, a foretaste of the ultimate um, regeneration of all things, as Jesus puts it, I think, in, in Matthew 19, the regenerate, the renewal of all things. One day for believers in the Lord Jesus, there will be no more defections, no more wanderings, no more backslidings. Behold, I make all things new. And this is what David is celebrating here. He restores my soul. Maybe that's a, a word very particular for some watching, listening this evening. Maybe you need to be restored. The Lord holds out his hands all the day long, we are told. He turns no one away who comes to him through Jesus Christ. Never doubt that your heavenly Father delights to restore. He doesn't need to be cajoled into it. He delights to restore and renew. But it may be it's not that you need to be restored to the Lord. It's that you need for the very first time to come to the Lord and to receive the forgiveness that he holds out freely to this whole world in his son, Jesus Christ. Sin will blind you to the wickedness and the vileness of sin. Satan is a master in seductively and alluringly drawing us and saying, um, sin is good. But in the word of God, we discover where sin leads. The wages of sin is death, ultimate and eternal separation from God. What a great thing it is to know that in our lostness, in our brokenness, in our estrangement from God, we can come to him who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy. He delights to forgive. Another Puritan said, judgment is God's strange work. Mercy is his proper work. So may we all of us know afresh what it is to be restored, renewed and refreshed as we come again to the Lord and find him waiting with open arms to receive us. May the Lord by his spirit bless his word to us all. Amen.